for, for my application, but I was not qualified because uh, my husband was uh, employed by the University of New South Wales under Robert Quinton, who uh, Robert was had his fingers in all of the theatre and drama and, and performance in um, Sydney at the time. And, uh, and uh, Pringle believed that, that I would be unduly influenced uh, by Robert Quinton through my husband. Um, he didn't know me very well. But <laughs> uh, and, uh, but fortunately, um, at that time, we'd also got to know Francis Evers, and uh, he and Philip together wrote uh, three large articles on the Opera House situation in 1960. They're, they're, they're hmm? canonical. Oh, are they? Well, yeah. that's good to uh, and, uh, um, and after that, Francis decided to return to Paris uh, and to... to to be with his friend Samuel Beckett, as I recall. Uh, they were a lugubrious pair, I must say. Uh, well, and dark and red sports coats, I think, didn't he, Francis Evers? He wore an, an overcoat, a dark, yes, a navy blue overcoat. He was always living inside this navy blue overcoat. And uh, uh, the office of the Australian at that time was in Canberra, of course, and uh, he was uh, briefed to go and review uh, theatre in, in Sydney and Mer Melbourne, but in order to get there, the best they could offer was was a, was a seat on the Matrix plane. So he had to wait for the Matrix plane to arrive in the middle of the night and and uh, and get a lift to interstate and then wait for it to turn up the next night. And in between, he managed to to <laughs> see some theatre. And so he got a bit fed up with that after a while, which is probably why he gave up. Um, the position, which I grabbed uh, with great enthusiasm. The theatre was a bit behind the rest of the arts um, in 67. There were little um, warehouse places and, and uh, converted churches and things uh, setting themselves up. Most of the theatre was semi-professional. NIDA had started and uh, and so had uh, their, their by-product, the Old Tote Theatre Company, that played seasonally in uh, the, what is now the Fig Tree Theatre, which holds 100 people. And it was this company that eventually, in 1968, was chosen to become our state theatre company. So uh, there were big changes happening, and, uh, and it was in the air. And um, oh, within, within a year of my arrival, we, we suddenly had what was called the Australian Council for the Arts which was rushed through very hastily uh, and a lot of worthy citizens were quickly appointed by Nugget Coombs to, to various boards and committees uh, because he was trying to get it all through by October 68, I think it was, uh, when there was an election and he'd been given some seeding money and, and he thought once he got, got it started then uh, it, would, uh, he, it wouldn't be able to be stopped. So we reported on all that. Now my um, my job was to write two columns a week, uh, and they were printed on the leader page. Uh, and I shared that space, about 1,200 words, with with Sylvia, and with Zoe Thomas, the art critic, and uh, Kenneth Hintz from Melbourne, who was the music critic. Uh, and who else? But uh, anyway, they. Uh, and 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 they were very often commented upon in the in the letters, which were also on the leader page. So, so it was a very collegiate thing, and uh, and it uh, it reinforced a, a sense that that what we had to say had some importance. Uh, I very you know quickly assessed the fact that because we were a national paper. Uh, like about two percent of my potential audience uh, were ever likely to see this production of the independent theatre, um, and so I had to find other ways. And I was a reporter, and the uh, and the columns that I wrote in those early days were, were clearly clearly reporting. I was looking for news. You know, where have our playwrights gone? Why are there no playwrights? This sort of thing. I was I was inventing news because there was, wasn't much around. And then suddenly there was. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I mean, there were this was 67, 60, and then 68, and and the Vietnam War was on. People were marching in the streets. Robert Atkin, Askin was quoted as saying, "Run over the bastards!" to a policeman when they were driving down the main street with LBJ. Uh, there, the, there was the you know, the permissive society that came out of the of the arrival of the pill. There was. Um, uh, the, you know, there were assassinations happening in America re regularly. There was a sense of, of fear and excitement and, a, and also the freedom to say what you like and that you could make a difference somehow. Uh, and I just thought it was marvellous. Uh, and one of the reasons that I felt I was, I was free was uh, that about three months after I... Uh, uh, had joined the, the paper, I went to Walter Connor and said, uh, I haven't had any comment from the editorial about what I'm doing. Is it what I'm doing, doing what you want? And he said, I don't know, I've never read you. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, never mind. <laughs> but, uh, but they were so busy in management to, to getting the paper around Australia, as, as, uh, yeah. as Mark was describing. Uh, what they had to do was to was uh, before offset printing came in was uh, was to make up the pages in hot metal, make a paper mache matrix, and then fly it in these little play, uh, planes along with Francis Evers <laughs> into state. And there was a, there was a, a northern edition and a southern edition uh, printed in in Brisbane and and Melbourne. And so that's how it started. So one one advantage that had for for us uh, was that, and certainly for me, was that I didn't have to do overnight reviews anymore, which I'd learnt to do on the Australian. And you know, King Lear in 20 minutes after rushing back from the theatre, <laughs> uh, and filling the hole, as they said, the, the sub editor left for me. It was a skill which uh, which we all learnt, you know, and and quickly lost the art of doing when, when we didn't have to do it any, anymore. Um, oh, but of course, well, Walter Comma was gone uh, a, a month or two after our conversation, and Adrian Deemer arrived, arrived blessedly because uh, my, the next dramatic event was uh, a libel suit from Peter O'Shaughnessy for my review of his Othello, which has gone into the history books now. Um, it was uh, the problem was I was I was I, I sort of appeared to know too much about the production and hit too many uh, <laughs> um, home runs I think which was unfortunate for for, for Peter I, uh, he was he it was a his Australian actor who was had quite a reputation and he'd been li living and working in England and he came back and announced he was going to play a cello and that was going to be even better than Olivia's and, and, and that sort of thing. So the expectations were high. The performance was at the Conservatorium, the old Conservatorium building. Uh, and, uh, and I really thought it was going to be something and I went along with those expectations, and it was a deeply, deeply old-fashioned production. And and I thought he was upstaging the, the rest of the cast. He was not. He was directing it as well as acting in it. A very difficult thing to do. And he, you know, and he had an ad hoc cast. He didn't know any of the cast and everything. And um, in the middle of my, and my, it was a, it was a thoroughly. Uh, uh, excessive uh, uh, piece of writing on my behalf, but I just got worked up about it and I said something like, um, the waste and dishonesty of this production um, has made me very angry indeed. Um, and of course the, the, it was the word dishonesty that uh, brought about the court case. Um, we won the court case, the judge decided, well the jury uh, decided that uh, it was opinion and I was entitled to my opinion in the matter of public interest. Uh, he, um, O'Shaughnessy appealed, went to appeal and then it went to the High Court and the judge in the High Court then gave us, uh, um, sent it back for a retrial on the grounds that uh, there were facts in the 
article as well as opinion. Like, you know, this play was Othello, this was the cast, and, <laughs> and it was on <laughs> at this theatre. So, so by that time, um, uh, the Australian had run out of Puffle Mirror newspapers, I should say, had uh, thought they'd had enough fun, and uh, so they settled for, I believe, uh, 14,000. Uh, Which is speaking those pounds or the, yeah. Yes, it was. 14. Were you shocked that, they, that he would take that step and, and actually take it to court over that? Yeah, well, I, I was. Sure, I mean, but it never crossed my mind, of course, you know. But uh, as I was saying, saying to, uh, to 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 Mark earlier, you know, there there they were there was no lawyer on the premises in those days, but they no. got one pretty quick, quickly That's after right, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it ruined Peter's life, sadly. I um, mean, he did go on working, but he continued to write to me for, um, from. You know, the early 70s until he died about two years well, ago. Well, he really got obsessed by it and wouldn't leave it He alone. did, and he wrote to everybody he could think of. He wanted, he wanted a meet, you know, a justification for what he'd done. And, uh, and he uh, uh, recently, I believe, um, established a website that's got about uh, 15,000 words of explanation about it all. And I have, I've never looked at the website. <laughs> um, but I mean, some of the backstage problems, of which I was not aware. One was that at the dress rehearsal, the final dress rehearsal, um, during the uh, strumpet scene with Desdemona, he he hit her um, quite and <laughs> did some damage to her, uh, which is something an actor learns very quickly never to do. Um, and she was so upset, she she went off to a psychiatrist and and uh, and refused to go on stage. And so it was seven o'clock in the evening of the opening night before she finally caved in and said, "I'll do it," you know. And I and I ended my review by saying that Miss Thody looked as uh, she'd had enough for one evening, and so had I. <laughs> 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 I also said that I thought sort of, Robert Inglis, who was playing Iago, was rather, it was a rather soft um, performance and, uh, and that, that he, he had more energy when, when Othello was not on stage with him. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, at the time I didn't think about upstaging, it didn't occur to me, you see, I was just reporting what I saw. Uh, but uh, but of course that's what everyone leapt on and said. Of course he's you know he's, he's that kind of actor you know who upstages when he, whenever he can. Um, he, he and Barry Humphreys did a, a production of Waiting for Godot in the in the fifties and they were quite fast friends uh, until until Barry became famous in the way he has and and uh, Barry told me once that, that every time they were in the same city and Barry is performing that. But that Peter used to go and give him notes on his performance <laughs> after, after the show, <laughs> and if Barry wouldn't see him, then you know the the, the notes would be delivered. Um, so there was you know something sad uh, about him, and uh, which I regret. But uh, you know you can't deceive an audience. That was one of my principles as a critic. You can't you know say something is better than it is. Uh, you you have to. Um, Define what what it is, and then try and illuminate that for, for your for your reader. So that that's the Othello case. And there was much more that hap was happening by then. '68 was uh, it was an extraordinary year um, with protests, yes. and I remember um, the ensemble, the mild little ensemble theatre as it is today, um, did a production of a. Canadian play called Fortune in Men's Eyes was set in a prison center, and it was about, it was about uh, overt homosexuality and violence and bullying and so forth. Uh, and uh, this was was used by the um, uh, the protesters about our conditions in prison to, to you know to make public protests. And and the Minister for Corrective Services, John Madison, got very involved in that. Even Darcy Dugan um, <laughs> came and joined us on this. So it was in the news and, and I was being a, re a reporter, which, which you know, critics just don't do anymore. That's one of the sad things I feel about about how the papers have gone. That, that the, the, 
and nearly all the reviewers are, are contributors now. They're people from other... Mm. So they don't have a, a loyalty to, to, to the vision of the... Uh, the, the newspaper that they're working for, well, and start. they don't don't yeah. have this uh, this training to get your grammar straight. And, your, and some mm -hmm. of and them are insulted if you call them a journalist. That's right. I'm, I'm that's proud right. Of it. And they, there's an assumption that that their view is is um, of, of of importance, and that people will read it. And what I was doing, and probably the rest of us were doing, was striving to find a, a way to get people to read your column, because yes, that yeah. was where your power was. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, anyway, by 1974, uh, I'd, uh, Philip and I would started Currency Press, because we got so excited. We, we were away on study leave in 69-70 in for six months, and came back with an evangelical need to do something about about in making known all the wonderful changes that were happening that we'd been observing in the theatre and to show people that we had something that was different and uh, that reflected uh, the, you know our, our nation which is you know n looking back on that statement you read about the arts and things that that's what the Australian was always trying to do in those those young days as they were mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and so so we started Currency Press to publish the texts of our plays to give you know tangible proof of being being a writer to our young playwrights and uh, that's now 40 years ago and uh, and I've done other things. Um, I wrote a lot of notes. It was just at the end. I wanted to say that I've forgotten. Um, oh yes. Yes, um, the, the uh, uh, I, by '64 I, I, I had a conflict of interest because I was, you know, I, I couldn't review the plays that I was publishing, uh, and or, or, or promote the the playwrights, and so the, the, there came a point when I thought I have to stop this, and uh, I was also embroiled in the uh, the campaign with David Maher and others to get uh, Jim McNeil out of jail, and. Uh, and we succeeded in that, and got his plays on in Sydney, and and uh, lived to regret the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the but it was an adventure, and so and so um, I left, and I, I I went to Jim Hall and said, look, I, I I can't do this job anymore. It's too big. I can't cover the whole country. I'm I'm losing ground. I'm getting too many. Um, Yes, press releases and things. I mean, the, the publicity game in the 70s didn't exist really. You had to find it out yourself. Mm. But uh, but the uh, you know the, the but I, the, I was inundated with stuff and and the it was getting more and more in difficult to, to get the money to go interstate from the Australian. Mm. Uh, and so I said, look, I'll give you a month's notice. Um, unless we can put, a, you know, a point, a stringer in each state and let me do an overview uh, to become a reporter on the arts. And, um, and he said no, that he couldn't do it. And so, uh, so that was the end of my time, almost the end of the time, my time with the Australian. However, um, after I left, uh, Maria Perrault was appointed as the first arts editor and uh, he, she organised the arts. <laughs> she was a great organiser, and she was given an arts page. And everyone thought this was, a, you know, a big boost to get, you know, a whole page to yourself to be covered every day um, from all over Australia uh, by a whole, you know, a handful of people. Um, and I occasionally I wrote reviews for her when she asked me. But I soon found that. What she'd done was to divide the page up neatly uh, into p uh, blocks of 500 words. So whatever you wrote about, it had to be 500 words. And I said, I can't stand this. I, I won't tell me what's important today in, in my field. Uh, it's, you know, it's very democratic to have 500 words, but sometimes I'd like to write a thousand words, and sometimes I'd, tell, I'd like to say, don't, don't Publish anything on this; it's not worth it. Uh, that's, uh, yes, I haven't mentioned that. Um, I, early on, I, f I found this um, I, that I wanted that sort of freedom, and I went to Douglas Brass and said, I c "You're paying me lineage 
and I can't stand, I can't stand it. I want to be paid not to write stuff which I think is wasting the newspaper. Um, and uh, and he agreed with me, and so so um, so we agreed that I would be paid seventy dollars for two doc two columns a week, and that was my salary for the whole seven years. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, uh, yes, the, my, my, the, my last journalism with, with the National Times, where I where again found the freedom that I wanted uh, under David Maher as editor. He, said, he gave me a, a page uh, to write a feature every, once a fortnight on anything I liked. And we had a great time until he got sacked <laughs> uh, for, the, uh, for two, for allowing two articles. One was, was an obituary of, of Robert Askin published the day, day after his death, which brought let it all out. And, uh, and the, the, the second one was the bottom of the harbour scheme. So that was um, the, the last I, I had to do with journalism, and, as I said. <laughs> so, sick, glor oh, sorry. sick transit Gloria uh, in the world of, of journalism. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. <clears throat> I remember that the day David got the news he was sacked. He was in Adelaide at the festival. I remember he came into the bar at the festival and said, said he'd just got the sack from the National Times. Oh, yes. <laughs> no, dear. Uh, well, Ashley's going to talk about today, today's arts coverage from the Australian. Yes, yes. Well, it's interesting actually listening to um, the history of cultural coverage at the, at the Oz. Um, and uh, there's lots of things that have stayed the same, lots that have changed, obviously. And one, the, 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 just the other day, I was editing a, a review out of Melbourne. It was a theatre review. And um, in the back of my mind, I, I cut an adjective. In the back of my mind, um, it was the Catherine Brisbane principle. Uh, it, uh, he was attributing an intent, I think, to the, to the author, uh, of the, uh, to the director of the, the play. And I thought, you know, we're... In the back of my mind, that case still resonates. <laughs> so it, it got cut. Um, but I think, in terms of reviewing, one of the things that has changed quite dramatically is the presence of technology in, in recent years, social media in particular. Um, we, and this as well goes back to what Catherine was saying in, in the your overnight reviews that fortunately disappeared for you, have returned. Um, and there's now a, a lot of speed um, and a lot of um, urgency to get that up. And there's a very simple reason for that. Um, all of our, the majority of our critics are on Twitter. I encourage them to be doing that all the time. Um, but they're no longer the only, only voice uh, after a production. And people may walk out of a, a piece of theatre um, and there'll be a hundred tweets out there talking about what the production was like and we may be one of them um, uh, it's it's the very reason that the next day instead of waiting to publish our review sort of 36 hours later I'll be getting hours, hours up online first thing so we can be a part of that conversation um, and I, I think that is important but just in the the, the, the role of, of the reviewer has changed somewhat um, because of the, the social media um, but at the same time, um, I think uh, the the authority that our reviewers and reviewers generally bring to bring to their job means that they're obviously going to be turned to um, more more than more than most, uh, which is in the same principle as a restaurant review. You, you go onto Urban Spoon or something, you see 500 reviews, but you're also interested to uh, put a lot of weight in what John Leslie and or at Fairfax um, Durack might be saying. Um, I, I think the the authority that people like David Stratton and Evan Williams, who, have, who know so much more about film than I can imagine, um, or Christopher Allen in, in the arts world, or um, Jordy Williamson in books, um, it's it's uh, it's it's just I, I think they bring that authority to to what they do. Um, and while I think the the nature of reviewing and reviewers has changed. Um, it's certainly the case that the producers and the directors um, still are very, very interested in what we have to say um, in terms of review. Um, and I think one example of that uh, was a couple of years ago, the musical of Officer and the Gentleman, it was the musical version of the film. Um, and Deborah Jones, um, former arts editor, a very knowledgeable critic, she went along twice uh, just to make sure that she wasn't wrong. Um, and she didn't like it. She she wrote about the 
I remember this phrase, the cringe-making obviousness of the show. Um, and look, these things happen. It was, it was not a positive review. Um, the producer, Douglas Day Stewart, who I think was the writer as well of the film, um, he got in touch with me. He sent a big, long letter, which we put online, because that's the great thing that we have as well, and now just being involved in that conversation. Um, and he, he, he took great issue with her and uh, called her an executioner and not a critic, um, and over you know, very, very strong language. And uh, in doing so, he, he, he brought thousands more readers to Deborah's review um, that would have been <laughs> the case otherwise. And uh, look, the show finished six weeks early. I, I, I don't know whether that had any, any role, but um, there, there certainly was that. I, I, I encourage as much as possible to, have, to, uh, to, to see a lot of that debate happening, um, the conversation happening, and sometimes that's going to be happening online, sometimes social, just on social media, sometimes in the paper. But ideally, you've got that. Um, that it's, it's happening in all three. Um, but so while that's one, one thing that's changed over the years, that I think there are some constants in, in the Oz and the arts coverage. And my perspective is, is recent, obviously. I've only been arts editor for a couple of years. Um, but I think, in taking a big picture, I think one of the problems with arts journal journalism generally, um, and I certainly don't mean that the Australian, but generally, is that um, there is that perception of um, of the the presentational journalism that uh, the the coverage can be a bit softer than it could that it should be. Um, and for instance, I have a big problem with a, a um, there's a there's a prominent there's a, there's a case in Australia where um, a, a journalist, a, a good one, writes a, a relatively soft story each week about a, a production, and then that weekend reviews it. Um, and is that that cycle happening far too much? And I guess my point, though, is that um, the the arts community in Australia these days, and I'm, I'm sure in the past, but especially now, um, is so vibrant and strong and um, and resilient that it doesn't need any special pleading from us as journalists. Um, in fact, it's the opposite. Um, I think that by engaging with the arts in a robust way um, and a really um, serious way, that, um, that that's the best way that we can um, approach the arts. And I think that's what we do at The Australian. Um, uh, the, just the, in terms of the amount of space that we have, two pages a day um, devoted to the arts and um, a weekend supplement, with, which is second start in the country. Um, and we, Matthew Westwood, for instance, is my predecessor as arts editor and I think is currently one of the best cultural journalists in the country. He has space to write a weekly column about the arts, which is not based on any particular production or you know, promoting a, a show or anything like that, but is, is just about ideas and trying to, to engage with the ideas. And um, uh, often that can be celebrating excellence, that often it can be um, looking at other sort of controversies that, that are going on, such as the, the BNR sponsorship or the Opera Australia's recent problems with um, a gay slur with one of their singers. Um, the fact that he's got, he's given a, um, a platform each week to just to reflect on these ideas, I, I think, is to great uh, to the great credit of the of the paper. Um, but and there's other things like um, Michaela Boland, our national arts writer. She's been pursuing quite vigorously for a number of years a um, a story involving Supash Kapoor, a dodgy art dealer who used to be based mm. in New York, who um, sold a bunch of art to the NGA, among others, mm. and um, and it looks very likely that it was all looted and um, not, not a lot to the great credit of the NGA. Um, it's that's one of those kind of traditional stories of real, um, just uh, hard hard work behind that one, just digging and digging and digging on Michaela's part, um, facing a lot of resistance, uh, which often happens with, with strong news stories. Um, and, but broadly though, not only has she, she managed to break story after story, but she